Warning, this episode contains strong language. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to a very special episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. We are going to skip the intro and skip all the nonsense and just jump right into the episode today. It's a long episode and I want to give you plenty of time to listen to it. Um, Before you listen to the episode, make sure to check out a news article, okay? You're going to search AP News and Funware, P-H-U-N-W-A-R-E, okay? So that's sort of the backstory. They were in the news. They are a company that ran the Trump team's uh, mobile app, and there was some controversy behind that, and we uh, got the CEO, Alan Nitowski, on to talk about it, and it was, it's almost like two podcasts because the, the company's actually done some amazing things. Um, so we talked about that. And then we talked about the app and its relation to Trump. So it does get political in the second half of it. And, um, you know, Al and I were able to have a, a conversation. Um, I definitely didn't agree with a lot of what he had to say when it came to his political um, beliefs. But, you know, that, that's the great thing about the podcast. We can still have a conversation. And, and he was very open to answering any questions and, and uh, being very open. So got to give it to him. But anyway, don't want to talk too much about it. Let's just jump into the episode and, and get going with it. So anyway, um, want to thank everyone for listening this year. This is actually our last episode of the year and the season. So we're, we're finishing out season two and the year 2020 with this episode you know, kind of fitting, I guess. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just listen, thank you so much for supporting us and um, allowing us, you know, to come back next year and do this some more, you know, bigger and better. Without y'all support, we wouldn't be able to do that. So thank you so much. It, it really does mean a lot. It keeps us going. It keep, hey, Look, I have the greatest job in the world. I love this job and I get to continue to do it. So I'm very happy, so thank you so much. And to the team here at the Lone Star Plate and Texas Real Food who make this uh, happen as well, thank you to them. Just an amazing group of people um, that make this happen. So I want to wish everyone a happy holiday, and um, you know, hopefully you get to spend time with your family, your friends, however that be, remotely um, or, or whatever. Please be safe out there. Wear a mask. We're, we're not over this yet, so... You know, just just we're in the we're in the last leg here, and don't don't give up, um, and stay strong. So my best to everyone and your families. Let's just get to this episode, right? Okay, here we go. Alan Natowski from Funware, P H U N W A R E, uh, and again, make sure to check out that news article before um, listening to the episode. I highly recommend it, and if not, afterwards, I guess is fine. Um, or pull it up while you're listening to it. Uh, And we'll have a link in the uh, description of the episode. So again, thank you so much. Here we go. Alan Natowski. Enjoy. Uh, Well, again, uh, thank thank you so much uh, for for joining us today, man. I really, really appreciate it. Excited to talk to you. Um, I figure first we just start with a little bit of background uh, about yourself and and sort of what brought you, what got you to Austin, what got you to Texas, you know, and sure. what sort of other connections you have in Texas, you know, uh, that sort of thing. We'll just start there. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, go go ahead, Alan. You you, I'll let you sort of. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry about that. Introduce. I was I wasn't yeah. sure if you were queuing up something or just doing. Free- no, no, no. Yeah, and look, <laughs> by the way. This it's very relaxed. Okay. It's not, we don't do interviews. It's just conversations and. Oh yeah. Right. Let's, oh, this let's, stuff's let's easier. I, I do these all the time. Although we, we rotate through some of the financial conferences now are all remote and then a lot right. of podcasts and videos and other stuff get to be remote. Um, it's always fascinating to watch mainstream media is uh, I feel like I can't watch the news anymore because there's no news. All the actual <laughs> news doesn't get covered. And then anything it's all remote yeah. is all propaganda. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we, we have a lot of that. Uh, but yeah, so I actually was uh, in the military until about 90, 1996. Um, I actually could only afford to go to the University of Miami on an ROTC scholarship. So uh, Funware, where I'm the CEO now, uh, our COO and I are both ex-Army uh, Rangers. So I did ROTC. He did West Point. Um, my first you know, assignment in life was the 94 nuclear weapons inspections in North Korea. Uh, wow. Un back then instead of Kim Jong-il. Uh, but I lived on the DMZ for a year and that was kind of welcome to the real world. And uh, Randall, our COO, he actually um, served a couple tours over in the Middle East in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, wow. We both got out of the military. Um, I started in California. He actually beat me to Texas, uh, but he ended up doing an MBA at the McComb School of Business at UT Austin and was a Kaufman Fellow, uh, and he was running the Central Texas Angel Network. Uh, as it turned out, I spent 12 years in California, split between Silicon Valley and uh, sort of Newport Beach, Newport Coast area, uh, which was great. Um, but I kind of learned how to do all the startup thing while I was uh, post-military and in Silicon Valley from uh, 96 uh, to about, uh, I don't know, I guess about five years, about 2001, right after the first bubble. Uh, I lived through the second bubble in 2008 while I was in Southern California. Uh, I got to see the real estate up front when, when that was happening. And then I decided to uproot out of California. I set a trend apparently that now it's really flooding towards Texas. Uh, yeah. But I came here in the summer of 2008. So I've been here a little more than 12 years in, in Austin. Wow. And what really brought me here was not dissimilar to what you're seeing bringing people here now. Um, I couldn't stand, I sold my first company to Cisco Systems, a uh, networking equipment company. And when um, I saw how big the check was, I wrote to the state of California and realized that if I was in a place like Texas, it would be zero. Um, the federal you still have, but not the state. Yeah. I did economically, it was insane to keep paying ridiculous taxes for really lousy services. Uh, now it's almost becoming a punchline. I mean, when you look at the Bay Area, um, they still have you know, tons of venture capital investment, tons of angel investment, great big companies. But like every single week, this week, it's obviously Philip Packard coming to Houston. Yeah. Almost like the last one. Elon Musk. Uh, I just read an article that Elon Musk, there's, there's blur about it, that he's coming, that he's going to move to Texas. Yeah, I saw that today as well. Um, it, honestly, if you're running a business, uh, you know, even Funware, we're headquartered in Austin, but we have two uh, offices in Southern California, one kind of Rancho Bernardo, Northern San Diego, and yeah. another in Irvine in the Newport Beach area. Um, we set it up that way when we started about 12 years ago. But honestly, I mean, it's getting really hard to justify being in California. And it's not because, you know, Southern California has the greatest weather in the world. Uh, I'd love to uproot you know, the tax structure of Texas, the climate of Southern California, and maybe the waters and is of the Caribbean. Uh, but so do that. I like it. I like it. <laughs> uh, you know, here in Austin, um, you know, Randall and I met because I first moved here, joined Central Texas Angel Network, thought I would do some investing, um, realized how wildly different you know, startups in Texas are from startups to how I learned how to do it in California in Silicon Valley. And uh, Randall was actually the managing director of CTAN Group while I was a member. And uh, I thought I was just going to invest, join some boards, be an advisor. Uh, and then the serial entrepreneur bug got the better of me. Um, <laughs> I moved here also for my family. I, you know, while uh, I have all of my kids were in public school in Texas, uh, none of them were in public school in California. It was all private because it was a mess. Oh, and wow. So started comparing the tax burden, the business difference, um, the quality of life for raising a family, the public versus private education battle and all things in between. Um, it just became compelling to uproot, move here. Um, and, uh, you know, now I'm uh, uh, with seven kids. Wow. Got, yeah, five, five girls, two boys. Uh, six out of seven are in college simultaneously. So two are here at the university. You know, at the University wow. of my background, I'm in Texas, but the U.S. Yeah. Council and uh, 
near and dear to my heart is the University of Miami from uh, going there in 87 to 91 during the, the ESPN, the U part one and part two of hurricane football. Yeah. So, you know, I've basically got a, a year at the University of Miami, a junior at Texas A&M, a sophomore at the University of Oregon, and then three freshmen, one at the University of Miami, one at Texas A&M, and one at Incarnate Word on an eight-year medical program. And then my son, his name wow. Kane, after wow. the hurricanes, of course, because that's what you do when you name your, your son Kane. <laughs> uh, he'll probably go to Florida State just to piss me off, but uh, I jokingly <laughs> said he, he's a freshman in high school. Uh, and so, you know, really about three more years before he'll get done here. It's been crazy with all the kids of, you know, how does Florida versus Texas versus Oregon deal with COVID? You know, how does travel, uh, you know, we've yeah. got a workforce where everyone's locked down in California and here in Texas and Florida, everyone's laughing at them of just how stupid it is. Uh, then we get to watch, you know, idiotic people like the mayor of Austin, uh, similar to other you know group that keeps saying i want to put all these rules in place rules for thee not for me uh it's the most disgusting form of leadership and me and randall being ex-military um i never ask anyone to do anything that i'm not willing to lead front by example and i do what i say uh you don't say what you want everyone else to do and then act like you're above everyone you're so important that you almost go like this to that are unimportant, apparently. Um, and then it's even equally disgusting to watch with all kids at school, like lockdown, shutdowns. I mean, it's a joke. You know, kids need to be in school. Um, the poorest communities, um, the least advantaged kids across the country are getting devastated with their families and their parents by not being in school. And anyone who's trying to say because science is just kidding themselves. Um, of saying, great, I can be in Texas or Florida with our company or a bunch of people I know, and, and we can live life and assess risk and try to be adults responsible. Um, you know, it's okay, wear masks, uh, have some distance, but like shutting down life, uh, no. Um, killing every small business, no. Um, and as you see, this is all political because you know it's only certain states where it's all locked down, others are open where we're at. And then you see the battle here in Texas between Governor Abbott, Mayor Adler, and the others trying to impose like, you know, how much control can I get away with? How much can I demand of everyone while I live my life, and do whatever I feel like? And I think people are sick of it. Yeah, I definitely uh, don't like the hypocrisy of telling us to uh, stay home. I don't know if it's malicious in the sense of diabolical. They're sitting around thinking how much control I get. We probably disagree there, but definitely don't like the hypocrisy from a lot of different, you know, politicians. Uh, it's been happening where they're saying, yeah, lockdown, but we're going out to dinner. Definitely not a good sign because it's just going to make yeah. people not, not trust the system and uh, not trust their word. And, you know, yeah, that's absolutely, uh, de definitely agree with that. Um, yeah. let, let's talk a little bit about, um, I, I, I'm sorry, don't, don't mean to change, but I, I, gosh, I found something so fascinating when I was reading, um, about you and your company, uh, with Miss Mythbusters, you guys were connected sure. to Mythbusters, right? Like, this is so cool. I love that show so much. I used to just think that was like the best thing. I just thought, man, if I could ever get on that show, I mean, I just, I just, uh, you know, I don't know why, you know, why MacGyver was my favorite show growing up in like 18, right. and, you know, they take that time, put everything together and just be creative. And it was just something about that show was so, you know, wonderful. I'm curious how your company, you know, got involved and in, yeah, take us, take us through that journey. It's just such a cool, yeah. just so well, cool. Uh, so ironically, when we were first uh, exploring uh, what we were going to call the world's first companion television application. So when you go back to oh. in February 2009, uh, only 2% of the world's internet traffic was on mobile. Uh, today, that's more than 70%. Really? Uh, wow. Of the 70% of all the internet traffic that's now mobile, 90% are native Apple iOS and Google Android. Gotcha. And 10% would be like Safari, Chrome, uh, or, or I'm sorry, Google Chrome or, or Apple Safari. And okay. so what you find is like, Wow, like when you look at the world of the internet, over 70% is mobile and over 90% of that are native apps, 
versus mobile web, you realize that the traditional internet is somewhat irrelevant. And so when you think back in the day when we started, we had a belief that we wanted to focus on everything you need to succeed on mobile. Uh, so we opted to now, it's a good comparable, you know, when you think of Salesforce or NetSuite or Amazon AWS or Google Cloud, all these companies are having this massive cloud-based infrastructure. Um, it's all enterprise software and enterprise infrastructure that you license on one to five-year deals. In reality, what we focused on is said, I want to create a firmware ID for every human being on the planet, a device touching a network through their favorite applications that represent their favorite brands, shows, networks, sports, teams, venues. And so with Mythbusters, um, as you'll recall, like apps used to be this one little thing you would do. It wasn't an immersive experience. It used to be like a glider. <laughs> it used to be a currency converter or weather. That. Yeah. But yeah. we believed it had nothing to do with being an app but it was more of a branded mobile experience. So we pitched as part of a competitive RFP uh, for discovery, uh, Mythbusters. And they originally put out the RFP for a game. And so they had like Jamdat and they had Epic Games and all, all these really interesting gaming companies. And I'm like, this is insane. Like we're not gonna go compete after three months of an RFP. We had five days to do it. <laughs> this is what what mobile's about wow. like yeah. we thought what mobile's about is that high value touch point between your brand and an anytime anywhere user and if you're a fan of mythbusters like i was too yeah i was like look why are we trying to choose what a mythbusters fan loves let's give them everything let's give them the social part of it with facebook and twitter let's give them the ability to look at thumbnails uh photos videos Let's give them live television. Let's give them the ability to have a community. Let's wrap all their merchandise around and sales that they might want to do. People and fans want to buy or experiences they want to have. And so we came up with what we patented and got a patent awarded for branded mobile application frameworks. And it was five elements. What's new, hot, and social. Um, player engage, which was what's the core value you of why I even care about this app. Uh, yeah. Then we had a whole bunch of media and then commerce. And every application we wanted to build is based on that framework. And so we took everything that you might love about Mythbusters, plugged it in. And for the player engaged part to accommodate the RFP for gaming, we included three mini games based on three episodes of Mythbusters. Oh, and nice. It turned out to be awesome because when we launched it, this crazy load screen and all this Mythbusters stuff, stuff slamming through the app. And we were trying to show off the beautiful screen, all that memory and all that processing power on iPhone. And that turned out to be a foundational company launching event because not only did we win an app, we shouldn't have won against very big companies, but Apple looked at what our RFP was. We didn't know Discovery shared it with Apple and they said, that's exactly what this is about. These guys get it. And so suddenly my phone would just ring. I would have literally like, hi, I'm so-and-so president of NBC. And I'm like, how in the world did you get this number? They're like, oh, well, Apple gave me your number and said, you look like a dumbass. Stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> Call this number, talk to this guy and activate your content on mobile the way they do it. Just do what they say. And so suddenly not only did we win Discovery, um, across, you know, not just the Discovery Channel, uh, but the uh, international equivalents like DMAX over in Europe, uh, Discovery Channel Latina, uh, wow. and to Discovery from Brazil to, to Spain. We won education and all these others. And then suddenly we were doing CBS Mobile. We were doing the National Football League. We were doing NASCAR. So all of these application experiences that are some of the greatest wow. In the world, nobody ever knew that they were funware. It just so happened that it was their brand, their content, and we were building. And not only did we build the first companion television app in, in Mythbusters, but we built the world's first direct to consumer over the top or OTT mobile application portfolio, which you would know as the WWE network. And that was um, outside wow. of the NFL. 
WWE for is actually the second most popular in the world doing three live events per week on a worldwide basis. Oh, and yeah. uh, that ultimately even led to WWE investing in funware. So WrestleMania oh, really? oh, wow. by funware. Uh, wow. the Winter Olympic Games, the Men's and Women's World Cup, the Oscars, the Grammys, all these amazing experiences all turned out to be funware. Wow. Holy cow. Yeah. Uh, we've actually had a couple wrestlers on. So just for our listeners, check Mark Henry and Vicky Guerrero. Check, check those out. Um, yes. Oh, so fun, fun fact is an aside. I went to the U of course. So I, I went to school with Dwayne Johnson before he was the rock. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's cool. So, so the, the fanny pack days, right? Wasn't that the exactly fanny pack with the big yeah. gold chain and the short yeah. do and uh, he wasn't quite as big as he is now at all out for him but ironically he would come over to the lambda chi alpha fraternity house right across the street from the field he would eat we'd have bezzy the chef and they, you know, i'm sure Dwayne knows all about it but he was always there and frustrated because he couldn't get on the football field uh at the time to the he wanted because guess what the two guys in front of him were russell Marilyn and warren sapp and they ended up becoming nfl hall of famers yeah oh my well if you're not going to get on because of that at least it's them right like exactly yeah. Wow. That's incredible. God, life is so <laughs> is so crazy there. Did, did you ever get to meet any of the people from Mythbusters by any chance working with them? So we actually never went out to meet the cast. Uh, we always went to Discovery's offices in uh, Maryland um, and it. Silver Spring, Maryland. But we did most of all the work with them. But we uh, activated and helped support everything from what they were doing with Comic-Con and, and other things. But oh, we never yeah time directly with the cast that was always kind of separate from all the activities we did to, to activate the great content and the great show that they had sure absolutely i'm sure that's the case for a lot of those app experiences sure. right yeah yeah that that makes absolute sense so okay so you're just you're taking off now right everybody you're doing all this great stuff did you did you even have a moment to like take it in and really guide or was it coming so fast you're just sort of taking anything and everything and just building as fast as you can i guess yeah it was a lot like throwing down train tracks as a bullet train is flying and uh, <laughs> and, uh you know so there's a lot of growth awards right so we were very blessed that you know not only did we win an inc 500 award i think we debuted at like number 40 uh in the country but we stayed on there for five consecutive years. That's what they call the Inc. Honor Roll, which I think only 8% of any company that's won an Inc. Award has ever done it five consecutive years. Because as you know, when you're growing from bigger and bigger numbers, those growth rates get harder and harder. Sure. Um, the one that was even more crazy than Inc. Deloitte & Touche Fast 500. So we debuted at number four, I think, on the Deloitte & Touche list five-year growth of over 18,800%. Um, again, just going vertical because mobile was so new. The iPhone was out, but even Android hadn't come out. Um, we were invited into a very special thing along the way by Apple. Uh, they had a new device. They wanted us to build applications. Turned out we launched more iPad apps uh, day one than anyone in the world. All four of them were tied to Mythbusters. Uh, but it was interesting when Apple uh -huh. invited us to do that. It was about a six-page NDA. I think I had to pledge a few of my children as collateral. <laughs> you had to go to this nondescript building in Maryland. They changed the locks. They put white noisemakers on the inside. They chained the iPad to a desk. Originally, we were given uh, emulation software because there was no device. So you're programming an app for a system that doesn't yet exist. Um, and then we only had three funware employees that were legally allowed to touch the iPad. Um, and we were threatened with our lives if anyone learned about an iPad before it was launched. Uh, wow. Job. So, so that was like really fun, but it was absolutely real. That's crazy. So you're seeing this technology that you know is gonna hit the world Right. right. And just blow everybody away. Because at that point, there were a couple of tablets. Right. But not like that. Correct. Right. There was. Yeah. And I guess when they first started building, uh, they came up with the iPad idea first. But then I think Steve Jobs switched and ended up deciding that he was going to launch the iPhone in the smaller screen and go after the phone business. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. 
So that was just a choice of what to go first. And then you saw the Apple Google wars over time, um, you know, let, let there be no doubt of uh, the, the, how big the egos in Silicon Valley were. I mean, Steve Jobs felt betrayed by Eric Schmidt, thinking he sat on his board, went back to Google, completely learned everything, grabbed Android, and that was very, very ugly. And I think that, uh, you know, crazy backstory, um, you know, before Steve Jobs passed away, um, you know, he did a few things very interesting. One he did was a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg, then very young at Facebook, uh, not because he liked Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook, but because he remembered as a more senior member of Silicon Valley who had the benefit of Hewlett and Packard, who actually helped him as a child and gave him an internship and some computer parts, um, he paid it forward. Uh, which was important. I, I learned that lesson from Ron Conway in the SV Angel Fund, one of the, the mega angel funds in the Valley that invested in my first company that we had built and sold to, to Cisco. Uh, the second thing, though, Steve Jobs did was probably consistent with the personality you read about, uh, autobiography and, and elsewhere. Uh, he was pissed off at Google, and, and he left a billion dollars stock for Tim Cook and others to vest over a period of time uh, to destroy Google. Uh, oh, wow. What they do along the way in iOS releases to try to do that is fascinating, right? So how does Google make its money? Well, it was search. So what they wanted to do and why they had the app store and native iOS was to prevent the search dominance of Google to be ported into the Apple ecosystem. And if it wasn't going to be on browsers with the mobile web, and it was exclusively a native iOS, guess what? You could port without paying what it turned out to be billions and billions of dollars for placement each year for Google to get its search engine onto an iPhone. But that wasn't good enough because it's separate from trying to destroy search. What's the other thing you can try to destroy? The next big way Google makes money is advertising. So what did they do along the way, if you remember back to about iOS 9 or so, they created software that effectively allowed you to block all ads on your desktop, the mobile web, except you couldn't block ads one place, native mobile applications, which was the dominant ecosystem of Apple. So all of this that the outside, like, hey, this is all kind of this weird development of features. No, a lot of it is you know, very powerful people with a lot of money um, who decide to go after people. And, you know, you always hear hell hath no fury like a scorned woman, right? Uh, we always say, no, hell hath no fury like a scorned serial entrepreneur with access to a shitload of capital. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man, that's kind of scary, right? Like uh, a little bit for a little guy like me. Uh, that's kind of scary that, that that there's people out there with these uh, vendettas. Uh, that's more just revenge. It sounds petty uh, more than anything, uh, which I love Steve Jobs, but he did seem very petty in a lot of uh, different things. Uh, well, but it's know, probably you, you, what you, propelled you Look at all well. these guys and, and every one of them have their own unique eccentricities, which are important when you're talking about Elon Musk. I mean, great guy, but you, you have to have some level of the eccentricity. I mean, the only reason I've probably sure. been a serial entrepreneur you have to listen to everybody tell you what can't be done and say, watch, I'm going to go do it anyway. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, that's an interesting mindset to have as well, right? Because you're sort of trained uh, not, not to have it. And you're sort of trained to, you know, not break the rules and really breaking the rules and pushing things is, is really the people at the very, very top, <laughs> right, that are doing things, which is, is interesting. And, and what ways do you feel Funware broke some rules maybe in your industry? It, just to pivot from that? Like, what do you... Yeah, I mean, uh, so the biggest thing that was very different is we never believed in apps. We believed in mobile experiences. We believed in mobile first. We believed in mobile native. We believed in cloud infrastructure and everything you need to succeed on mobile through one relationship, one architecture, one procurement uh, contract, um, one means to visibly control all activities within all applications, whether it's smart tablet, wearables, smart TV, digital sign, kiosks, smart television, you name it. Um, and that was very different. You know, everybody wanted to port the internet to mobile. 
And what we did is flip that on its head and say, no, we build for mobile. And then you work backwards to the mobile web and backwards to the internet. I and see. Yeah. see the difference because, you know, if you're back very high profile applications, when they were just an extension of the internet, you probably downloaded, said this sucks and you deleted it. Absolutely. You built it. You don't care how much money they spent. You're just like, this is garbage. I'm not going to use this. Yeah. And we saw that. So what we did is we said, start with the user. You know, we love our favorite shows. We love our favorite teams, we love our favorite networks. We love our favorite anything. And how do you make it fun, playful, engaging, and addictive on a user experience with the horsepower of what you would see in things like packet switching and network equipment, voice over IP, and the, the kind of system that I are using right now? I mean, how insane is it to think Zoom could even exist? Because Zoom wasn't the first mover. I mean, we had Skype forever. We've had WebEx forever, we had Ring Central, but Zoom, like, years and years later come along and then create this. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see how sometimes you be, I would say you want to be lucky before you're good, but if you get lucky and good uh, with a little bit of breaks, I mean, look at what happened with the pandemic this year. If you were doing video conferencing, Zoom has gone vertical. If you're doing yeah. meal kit delivery, you know, Sun Basket, Hello HelloFresh, Blue Apron, uh, wonderful business when you're all locked up and then you see other businesses uh you know we we, we have customers like atlantis bahamas and and they haven't even been able to reopen yet whereas our work with like the wind hotels they've they've opened and closed and opened a little bit in in vegas austin very different macau very different and so it's turned into this business ecosystem where you now have to say okay what are hospitality companies doing what are governments need what are healthcare groups do? And we, and we do healthcare, you know, digital front doors from coast to coast, uh, whether it's Mount Sinai, Cedar Sinai, uh, NYU Langone, big massive systems, Houston Methodist, all of these, uh, you know, you get to live through what it's like to deliver healthcare um, in the middle of a pandemic. Sure, absolutely. So with y'all's service, do y'all provide just from top to bottom, like all the graphics, all the design? I mean, just every single part of it. Y'all are. Uh, yeah, know, but, but think of it a little bit more of having a, a cloud infrastructure. So all the server infrastructures and then software that goes on the devices within the applications that enable you to get feature sets and use cases. So sometimes it might look like mobile engagement, one-to-one uh, -one messaging. It might be marketing automation. It might be oh, I see. services before you get to an airport, while you're there, after you leave. Um, things right. like advertising. So all of these functionality, you know, analytics and content management, anything you need to engage mobile audiences. What we do is we license our platform and our software. And then companies are either typically, I call it do-it-yourselfers or They'll take, uh, you know, the flour, the sugar, the water, and the vanilla to make amazing cake if amazing for mobile applications. Uh, in our case, those would look like software development kits or application program interfaces or tool utilities, but it's all software they put in the applications that then go in the app stores that you use. On in other cases, you know, they, people say, hey, I'm, a, I'm an off the shelf. I like to eat cake, but I don't want to learn how to bake. Can you yeah. give me a solution? Uh, you know, we do healthcare well, but we know we need mobile, but we just don't know how to do that. So it's their brand, it's their content, but we pre-integrate our platform, license them solutions that yeah. they can use as if it's their own. Sure. Um, we see about a 50-50 mix between those who build themselves, you know, that like to be a better versus those that say like, I like to eat cake, give me some sprinkles or, you know, change the icing, but let's go to market. So it's a lot yeah. of five-year enterprise uh, SaaS deals, uh, not dissimilar to the way you license from, you know, any other occurring subscription service that you might, just like Netflix every month. Um, same idea. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, well, that's great. Uh, and have you seen, you know, cause when y'all first started, right, you're the first ones to do this. You're, you're 
hot on the market. You got so like anything, right? Other companies will eventually start to pop up and do this. Obviously, there's competing brands. Has that been difficult to deal with? And you know, how do you set yourself apart from? Is it just keeping that same idea y'all have always had, or because I would assume other companies would just take the same idea and and sort of try to run with it, or or what would? Yeah. So what what you find is that a lot of companies um, were started to focus on porting the internet. And those came and went because it didn't work. You found another group that said, hey, we're going to use the mobile web and everybody's going to use Safari and Chrome. That also sort of came and went. Um, what really won was native iOS and native Android. And we had a company on that when we started. So we were very fortunate to have made the right bets. And then over time, we've invested is more than $150 million now over the last 12 years between equity, debt, and, and gross marketing that we've plowed back into the platform. And, and by doing that, it's a lot like think about Salesforce, like Boeing or Dell could easily say, you know what, we're going to hire everyone. We're going to build our own customer relation management. System. We want to control our customer contacts. We want to control our pipeline. We want to control all of our revenue and we're going to build it all. Uh, but often they just don't. They say, you know what, Salesforce will always invest more than we will. Let's do what we do well. We'll license what Salesforce has, and we're going to use that to standardize our business. In our world, the decision is typically, will a customer try to build everything themselves, their own IT group or some agency relationship? Or will they say, you know what? Funware will always invest more than we dream of, and we know healthcare, but what to get the features from hospitality and sports and media and entertainment. Well, we do thousands of applications on our platform. Um, so we get to see all of that, give them the best of everything from everywhere in the world that we see it. Yeah. And we see more and more folks are really much easier to standardize on what we do, digital transformation uh, with a on their mobile applications and initiatives uh, than it is to try to build all that themselves. Um, the other groups we saw that sort of came and went are point solutions. Like I just do analytics or I just do content management or I just do location or I just do advertising. Um, a lot of those businesses have come and gone. A lot of them have been bought by other companies. Uh, this has really been exciting for me. I've, I've built and sold some companies before Funware. Uh, Funware I started from nothing. I uh, built it through more than $100 million of private financing took it public NASDAQ, and now we've been publicly trading for a couple of years. Um, it's really hard, uh, no matter whether you're public or private. Uh, it's probably more in the line of your public, but there's nothing more exciting than taking something from an idea in your head with a few friends uh, and building it over a decade to get to either NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and your reward for getting there is to get the living hell beat out of you. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's a, absolutely, that's a absolute feat. I mean, there's nothing but respect uh, for that, for sure. Uh, which the journey alone, that I'm sure there's tons of stories just from that uh, alone, just personally, right? Uh, I can right. only imagine. Uh, which which kind of, you know, brings me to this that, that I do want to bring up, uh, you know, something that I found also while researching was this AP News article, which I found so interesting about how y'all were, it just seemed very odd. It was like, I don't know, a duck in a kitchen. I, I'm a chef, so I don't know why I said that, but I just think of a kitchen, something odd out of the kitchen, like a live duck, just sure. running around. It just seemed odd. I just thought, fun where Trump, what's going on here? Why, how did y'all get caught up in this sort of drama, right? We were like, hey, we're just trying to run a company here. Like, well, we're not it's, uh, you know, look, I, I can detail out stuff that, like, right now, I, I kind of say there's, there's four political parties in the United States. You know, for the record, we have licensed our software to all of them. So like if I was Tim Cook for five seconds, uh, no one in the world would give me any grief because I sold iPhones to Republicans and Democrats. If uh, I was, I don't know, Sergey Brin at Google and I provided Google cloud services uh, to the Republican Party and the Democratic National Committee, nobody would care, right? If you're Microsoft and you license uh, software, Office 365 and People use it from different political ideologies that nobody. Um, similarly, if, if I was Michael Dell here in Austin, uh, and 
actually you know, sold equipment to anybody. Uh, no one would care any more than when you show up at a Hilton hotel, they don't ask political party and then say, sorry, you're a Republican, you have to leave or you're Jewish. Get it doesn't work that way. So when you see certain articles and we've sat in this, we've, we've actually supported uh, anyone who's a customer of ours and our goal is to provide the best enterprise software in the world to be able to provide bulletproof infrastructure that's unhackable, that three to 500,000 transactions per second, four to five billion per day, 15 billion fundware IDs, about 800 million to a billion of those are active every single day. That's about a petabyte of data growing at five terabytes a day. So that's a lot of numbers. But think of the world's largest brands on the biggest stage for the most important events in human history. Well, one of those human history events happens to be what we would call a presidential election. So in the world of advocacy and politics, which is very messy for all the reasons you and I could talk hours about, um, you know, learned how to do it at that level with the Olympic Games, a billion dollars of digital rights, a billion dollars of advertising, and three weeks of one of the most important live events in the world, Summer or Winter Olympics. Um, different for the Super Bowl, but what's bigger than the National Football League on Super Bowl Sunday? Um, WrestleMania, the Oscars, the Grammys. We've done all 10 of the top 10 live events on the history of the planet. And so we were very well suited to step into a high profile race like the presidency of the United States. And what really happens, sadly, is what you see battle of big tech and big media. Uh, it's not a surprise to anyone that we don't get the news, we get propaganda, uh, narrative agenda. We're asked to leave our own eyes and ears. We're acting like we're all fish or sheep and nobody knows it. So sadly, what you've seen over time is if I was going to break out the media coverage, you know, new entries like OAN, uh, Newsmax would very much be what we call the Trump Party. And the Trump Party is the established GOP. This might be like the old Bush established GOP, you know, of which the Trump Party was never really a part of. But as you know, you have to pick one of two parties to run if you want to win. Side, you got one Democratic Party, but it's really two, right? There's the extreme left progressive the squad, the Green New Deal, and some very aggressive views, identity politics, politics, and everything in between. And you have the more moderate kind of, I call it the, the Obama, even Clinton, dare I say, part uh, of the party. So there's really like two parties, but there's two subsections in each one. And then there's all the others, which you know you can't win. You know, if you're Michael Bloomberg, you try to captively take the Democratic Party like Trump did on the GOP side. But where it worked for Trump back in, in the day, it didn't work for Bloomberg, right? So those sets of parties are out there. Well, if OAN and Newsmax came out more recently to represent really the Trump Party, uh, the traditional GOP is more like Fox. And then everything else is ultra left with various degrees. So if you look at the New Yorker, Atlantic, Inc., Forbes, uh, uh, Vice, uh, then you throw in the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, you go through CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, the major networks. Uh, what you have now, the world of alternative facts and fake news, all everything is about. Me and Randall are both ex-Army Rangers. Ethics, honor, integrity, the true facts matter. We're life and death, and it isn't a joke. It's not a punchline. It's not funny. And when you watch um, AP, I mean, even recently, you saw AP put out something that, um, you know, the Attorney General of the United States, Barr, said there was no fraud. And then Barr, what happened? He immediately did this and said, I didn't say that. What? I've lived through this. I have our company get attacked. I've watched myself and other executives on my uh, team get attacked. You know, I've got a board of directors that's composed of six independent directors, three male, three female, 
Uh, I challenge you to find that composition on most tech companies or any company on Wall Street. 50-50 split of directors. We have a female chairman of the board, Blythe Masters. Um, and a lot of the folks on our board and others in our company have wildly different political affiliations. And, and nobody cares because we're here to provide the greatest software in the world. So when you see the AP article, uh, that's a hatchet job. It's lies. It, they don't even care about fact checking. Uh, we actually wrote a full article. You ought to have uh, see it's quite for the New Yorker who also published Road Scholar. And she lied through her teeth. She tried to frame as the next Cambridge Analytica about how I'm manipulating you and all the others. Their votes happen a certain way. Um, what we did for the Trump campaign uh, was we created the greatest mobile application portfolio in the history of the world for politics. And I'm not saying that as a joke. We took everything we learned from doing Mythbusters, doing the National Football League. You know, they tried to write an article and say, oh, why would anyone pick this company that did something, you know, with, uh, an astrology person, Susan Miller, or had never done it? That, that can be further from the truth. We're 12 years old. We have 5 billion transactions a day, thousands of applications. The biggest and most important brands in the world use Funware. Every network. And it's funny when you watch the same networks that want to write a ratchet job, when they need to do mobile, guess who they call? Me. You build CBS Mobile. You build Fox News, Fox Sports, NBC News, Live Extra, Sports, everything. Um, and so it's kind of funny to watch um, how what we were guilty of is we dared to allow our infrastructure, our software to be used by a political party. That wasn't the right one, right? Because Trump derangement syndrome and orange man bad. And what you watch is that we watched the New Yorker and AP and others. They wrote all sorts of things about all the media and data deals and all the data we were giving to the campaigns to do things. True fact, I'm a public company CEO. I, I can't lie. I've got an independent board. You think I can lie to the Securities and Exchange Commission? The only thing we've ever done with the Trump campaign are the mobile application portfolios, iOS and Android. They're the best in the world. Uh, we had millions of downloads to maybe a couple hundred thousand for the Biden campaign. You can look at Washington Post or CNN, which are not pro-Trump. We all know that. And they will analyze the two sets of applications and it's not even a comparison. When Twitter got hacked, guess what? Our applications didn't get hacked. When campaign websites get hacked, we don't get hacked. That's because we're used to dealing with 15 million simultaneous users for the Olympic Games on $2 billion of value that need to be broadcast live by country, by athlete, by sport, by venue, and all the rules that you see that go with it. We're exceptional at this. So when people try to trivialize who we are, what we do, it's offensive to us. Uh, when right. you see people make up stories and you realize that the news, we even try to tell them, we have never done a single deal. We would happily do it for any and all of them if they wanted to license our data to use it to make better one-to-one -one interactions, which is what we're all about. It's like, hey, it's you. Every funware ID is a self-identity. You're in charge of your own identity. You can have any mobile experience you want, by brand, venue by venue, App portfolio by app portfolio. So, because you have a different relationship probably with Starbucks and maybe stars and rewards for all their purchases. McDonald's, you may not want to use. Home Depot, you might be all in that. Or you might be into the win because you love to go to Vegas. You're a high roller. You love to go. Everyone chooses every brand as to what they want on their own. Who you bank with, what apps you use, trade stocks or crypto that is not unusual. So all we were guilty of is having been, you know, apparently wrong enough to be willing to license our capabilities to a political campaign that wasn't like mainstream media. And so, so you would, uh, I mean, what you're saying is you, you would easily license to the Biden campaign. No problem. Yeah, sure. We sure. actually have supported independence, there you go. supported any and all for Switzerland. Uh, yeah, but there you go. Well, there you go. But at the same time, uh, we're not apologetic and we're not going to be shamed or doxxed or publicly attacked. You know, like having seven kids and have people attack you in the press when it's all lies and your own children, you got to say, Dad, 
Associated Press said this or New Yorker said that. We wrote a full rebuttal and published it as a medium article line by line through the New Yorker. And we tried to tell them we don't have a single contract for data with the Trump campaign. We don't have a single media relationship. We have a great relationship. This would be like, you know, Amazon AWS kicking off Jewish people because they use the platform. And you'd be pretty offended by that, I bet. If you said all African Americans can't use Microsoft Office 365, you'd say, what the hell are you talking about? But what happens is when you're trying to influence voters and when you're trying to engage constituencies, um, you see the mainstream media doesn't care. Right now, I mean, right, wrong. Well, I'm an American, right? I fought. Yeah. I, I'm an ranger. Sure. I wore the uniform. I know what it's like to be forward deployed. Hell, Randall yeah. is one of awards for valor in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. You think we come back and watch people that don't care about the truth? It's obnoxious. It's one thing to say we don't know to what extent there was, you know, fraud in the elections or something that appears to have gone wrong. You don't do is say, hey, I'm reporting in the Simpson trial. We're about to go live. We're going to have opening arguments soon, and he's innocent. Well, who jumped all the way to the conclusion of the trial before it started? And what's happening now is it's like people don't care intellectually, actually know what the truth is. So you're saying that because they called President-elect Biden? Yeah, that's there equal- is no president. I mean, look, so as an aside, there's a constitutional process. There is no president-elect until the electors have and certified in the Electoral College. Sure. What do you see in the media? You see full speed ahead. We don't want to see anything. It, it, it is kind of peculiar that Trump accepted it to, in 2000. I'm just playing devil's advocate. I mean, I'm just being sure. fair here, right? Like he accepted in 2016, no problem. He came out that night, I won. Hillary said I won. He accepted the media saying he won. So just, just from that standpoint alone, that's a little peculiar, right? That's well, yeah. So like, hell, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to have lived through a lot of things. Right. Um, so I, I've seen, you know, Gore and Bush. Yeah, me too. When you go back historically, you know, Gore on today, as of right now, back when Gore Bush was still being put out, Gore hadn't conceded. In fact, courts had uh, actually awarded the entire presidency to Gore at every state in court action until the very last one, which happened to be where the Supreme Court. And then yeah, but changed. that was five hundred. That was five hundred votes, right, in one state. Well, sure, but county. when you when you watch That's the things that you're watching, you know, there's five thousand affidavits. It, you know, five thousand affidavits is five thousand people under penalty of perjury but they're and- all trump supporters that's the funny part no they're but that, that, that's supporters. that's simplistic that's you're you're even listening to the media so what i would well, say of course i i do watch the media i mean well, I yeah but opinion. when you watch the media your viewpoint is slanted towards whatever you're well being- i i don't appreciate you telling me how i look I, i'm being fair to you but please don't tell sure. me how i how i interact with the media and how i'm you, you don't know that about me so you're, you're okay right like, that, please, please. Coming, I'm, 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 I'm not that making that about you when I don't know the things about what really happened, uh, dead people don't vote. So there's something that's odd. Wow. People that aren't old enough to vote shouldn't vote. That's kind of odd. People no, vote. This happens every election, though, right? Like all of a sudden, it's a big deal. Like well, to the, it, it's to a the very big deal. Off. So I'll tell you just personal opinion now, right? Me personally, having been in the military and fought around the world and been a, a you know someone who served our country and in Nothing gives you crystal clarity more than locked and loaded live, looking down the barrel of a weapon on behalf of your country. So I can assure you, and no one appreciates peace more than that. I've, I've enjoyed sure. watching the, the degree with which we have not been in conflict in the last four years. Um, but when I say this, the media role should be to present news and let all of us, you, me, others, decide what we think. I think that's the way it kind of is now. Now, I agree with you. The media is not perfect. OK, of course, oh, the media is uh, on, the, on the right and no, left, right the media, no. on the right and left. On all sides. It's a joke. There is no media. I, I, I mean, I'm definitely not going to agree with you. I mean, you could say that's your opinion. No problem. Of course, you have your opinion. I, well, I so let me ask you this. You've read 1984 and George Orwell. You think that. Sure. Yeah, look, I, I'm just going to say I, I will never say anything 
like all everything is bad, right? Like all Democrats are bad, all Republicans are bad, all media. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that. It's not. What you just said. All media is bad. I'm saying as a public company tech CEO, it's offensive to watch platforms trying to decide the editorial content of their platform. They have no business being involved in that any more than Microsoft provides Microsoft Word. And then you or I or anyone else can write whatever we want to publish. Yeah. Your goal as Microsoft isn't to delete content that you and I are writing on the fly and to flag it because, I mean, hell, you know, do I think that it's okay for a leader of Iran to be on Twitter advocating for killing people, but that's completely okay as a tweet? And well, our president tweets all kinds of crazy things. So I think we allow a lot on Twitter. But, but my, my question is this, what, what media do you watch or, or read or what, what do you use? To right. So, so what I do is, uh, so first of all, I try to have the widest spectrum of consumption of information and research as possible. So I look at uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency research. I look at pure equity research, a variety of investment banks and others. I try to look at market intelligence information and competitive analysis from, from A to Z. Um, even though I know like the Gartner Magic Quadrant is typically bought and paid for. So you have to say, you know, where do you get information? Uh, when I look at the, the news, um, it's very difficult to watch anything on either television or online tied to any of the major networks. I mean, there's only six companies in the world that control media, just six, right? And, and within that, they're controlling the editorial decisions of what you see and what you don't see. So you and I may have very different um, uh, ideologies on certain things. That, that's okay. That's, that's what I love about America. What I don't like is it frightens me because books I read growing up when I was taking AP English in high school or, or just going through growing up in adulthood, you know, 1984, Fahrenheit, yeah, Animal yeah, I, Farm, I this. you know, sure. all these things that we've read and seen, um, you know, we should not be trying to decide what I suppress that you see or don't see, or what should I amplify that you see or don't see. That's absolutely not the role of technology. And it's not the role of media. And I remember sitting with my parents watching like Walter Cronkite, you know, back in the day. And there would be presenting the news and allowing people to make decisions. And nothing like I've lived through it. Look, I, I've wanted to give credit to group after group after group. If you live it, if, if I took the Associated Press, the New Yorker, USA, if I took the Washington Post, the New York Times, and I told them to invent stories on your company and then on you, and you could sit there knowing how factually wrong every little bit is. And if they're ever going to correct it because they were completely wrong, what would you see them do? Page you know, 12 of the fifth section in little tiny font, because nobody would ever actually admit it. And, and what I think has gotten disgusting in my adult lifetime is that it's propaganda, narrative, and agenda it's not news or information at all. But what about this, this AP article? You're saying it's completely false that they like knowingly made sure, it we, up. We go, like they no got, point by I guess what I'm at. Well, let me just get the question out. So you're saying just so I just want to understand what you're saying. So you're saying like they sat in a room and like said, OK, we're going to lie and we know we're lying. And it, the article references ex-employees of yours. I mean, I'm not trying to bring that up. I'm just saying. So you're saying that's all no, a bring, lie. Bring it up because it's, it's great. Yeah, and I'm just asking. Like million. that's what I'm saying. The article references that. So no, I mean, but here's here's the deal, right? So here's how this really works. So take forget funware for a minute. Take Coinbase recently. What did Coinbase do? The CEO and their team decided we're not going to have politics at work. Guess what? That was not acceptable to media on the left. So what did they try to do? They tried to, to obliterate both the CEO and the entire company. They do. Hey, we're the New York Times going to go run a story. We're going to interview all these ex-employees who were wrong. And we're going to go do a hatchet job. They did the hatchet job because they failed to comply with the desired narrative that is being pushed across, you know, identity politics and other things. That's what happened. So Coinbase said, I'm sick of it. 
for the same reason that we're sick of it, that someone's going to write a bullshit article, which is what it is, going to try to make it. It's usually, hey, we have anonymous sources. Oh, we have X employees. Get names. Let people go on the record, not invented. Like you and I could go to Glassdoor at any company and say, hey, who was fired and who's pissed off? If you don't think you have disgruntled people that look them in the eye and say, you didn't perform well enough hiring you, and then it gets to be turned into something else. When we look at those stories, you can actually look at them and say, where are the anonymous sources? Or my favorite, go look at uh, the New Yorker article I'm mentioning, which we wrote this big point by point thing to actually clarify factual. Well, look, we'll put, we'll put both links in the description for yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and when you look at it, what you'll find is like uh, Vice. Vice was even lazier than the New Yorker. The New Yorker wrote the story. Vice references the New Yorker article to make it have credibility. And they didn't even actually do any reporting. And so what you have is how many groups within the same system can point to each other's articles to establish credibility for something that's not credible. And that's how it works. When you can definitively say and watch someone write an article about what you're doing in data, what you're doing with media, how you're affecting and manipulating or all these things, or, hey, there was a threatening message that went out to this group, right? Like, that'd be like me saying to Microsoft, how dare you allow someone in Microsoft Word write content that they published and printed? Like, Microsoft doesn't have anything to do with that. We don't have anything to do with the content that goes through applications. Sure. Like I said, hey, I love the Mythbusters content, but let's say the actors on their Twitter feed said something obnoxious about someone. Well, that's in there. We enable it because our systems allow you to do messaging and our systems allow you to post content, but that doesn't mean that we're the ones doing it or doing it. So I sure. love the articles of things like AP because for me, it's so easy to go, great, let's go through each point that you want to talk about I watch people have anonymous employees and they don't say anything. So um, is that, is that basically, I'm mean, just to clarify, you're saying they're just disgruntled employees that said this stuff. Well, I'm saying that in some cases, the information is completely not even true. And, and like, when you talk about contracts, like uh, we have nothing. I we're a public company. If yeah. I had a data deal with Trump or Biden, I disclose, I have a data deal because if it hits materiality, I have an obligation to disclose it in 10Q or 10K. If it's material enough, I'd have to file an 8K in between our, our reporting. So th this isn't make-believe land. I, I can get sanctioned. I can get charged if I, as a CEO or our CFO, it'd be like our CFO making up financials. You know, that doesn't go well. And, and again, we run the company and we have an independent board. Do you think the chairman of the board, the chairman of the audit committee, the chairman of the governance committee? Because what do board members have? They have their reputation. And they sure as hell don't want to get sued. You wouldn't want to get sued. <laughs> so we actually care greatly about disclosures. So when we watch some of these you know, uh, articles get written, it, it actually is, is sad. It's disappointing to see because you know that someone is writing something to shape an opinion. And when you see the, the articles with Coinbase, what was New York Times? They were furious. Why? Oh, you preempted our story. Here's how it works if I did this to you and I wanted to go after you. I would actually contact you about two hours prior to me publishing. I've already written my story. I've already decided what narrative and agenda and points I want to make. And then once I do all that, I act like I contact the company so that they're going to respond. Now, often you might have something on your calendar that you didn't even have a chance to respond within that two hour window because you might be at a two hour offsite or doing something else or on a plane these kind of things happen. Then let's say I do respond within the two hours. Uh, it doesn't go up in there. It, it doesn't appear. Yeah. And in this case with the Associated Press, you know, we could go through all the points and it's, it's actually just sad. Um, there are contract references that don't exist. Uh, there are things that are quoted, attributed to employees that also don't exist. And it's what one about the PPP loan. That, that was something yeah, that stuck. That, that, we've, we actually put out public information on this. So it's even more funny. That's an even more funny one. So we applied under the CARES Act, much like every other company did, public and private. Actually, we should be in a better position to apply because unlike private companies, we and other small public companies all have fully audited financials. So if you're a bank underwriting loans, 
you want to underwrite loans with no financials or would you prefer to have on financials? And you've seen rampant fraud where people tried to create companies that didn't exist, employees that didn't exist, payroll records that didn't exist. They bought Lamborghini, Ferrari. That's fraud, yeah. right? Like yeah. someone wrote in there. Well, I think they were just saying political favoritism, which. Yeah. And, and do you think, do you think I've ever met Trump in my life? No, I don't know. Do you think that? No, Have you they, met any they, Trump they, member, any family member? No, never, never once in my life. So what the funny part of the whole thing is, is it's, I can tell you how we won the Trump deal. They even misquote that. They attribute it Carl Rove. I mean, shit, I haven't even met Carl Rove. So the way that fun <laughs> won that deal, which by the way, was a competitive RFP on merit. And the finalists were Mark Benioff's Salesforce versus Alan Natowski's Funware. And we had to go through, based on merit, I'd never met anyone in any political party in my life. The only reason I even knew that the RFP was available is I had a CEO of a Silicon Valley company who I met in Asia on a blockchain tour when we were going between Singapore, Japan, China, both Beijing and Hong Kong, Thailand, and the Philippines, and Taiwan. While there, I met the CEO of a very large company in Silicon Valley. I got to know his business better. He got to know mine. We were presenting on the same stage in different cities together. It was actually just a, a wonderful thing of, of getting you know, a lot of intellectual stimulation. Um, we left Asia probably about five months later. That CEO contacted me and said, hey, um, I'm aware of an RFP. I think you guys would be awesome based on what I learned about you. Would you guys be willing to consider participating in the RFP? And I said, well, sure, but what's for? So me and our CTO, Luan Dang, I, I joke with my Vietnamese twin, we were out in California in the Bay Area meeting with customers and partners. And we met with him at a cafe in Palo Alto. And then after that, he introduced me directly to Brad Parscale and Gary Kobe, who were two of the senior members of the Trump campaign as it related. You know, Brad was actually the campaign manager. Yeah. Gary was more of a, a digital mobile kind of expert. So when I watched someone publish an article telling me how I met the campaign, how we won it, it's all lies. It, it's not even hard for me to get so annoyed when you're saying my CTO and I in Palo Alto, California, met a CEO at his request, we participated in an RFP, had we lost it, Salesforce would have won it. Do you think Mark Benioff or Salesforce would have been attacked for providing Salesforce to the Trump campaign? Uh, spoiler alert, no, not at all. And in fact, Salesforce does license its software to both campaigns, much like Facebook allows advertising for both campaigns and every other tech company provides everything to both campaigns. Yeah. So in our case, we did nothing any different. Um, the PPP loan, we just applied. Um, we were no different. The rules kept changing. We applied with one bank uh, that we had a relationship with called Bridge Bank, which is out in Jose. Uh, we also had another relationship with Chip and we applied on both sides and we realized that um, that one that we were doing with Bridge Bank, it seemed like that they weren't sure they were going to support PPP loans. We opted to submit not through them, but Chase, because they were already we had a relationship for years. We watched these things written of like, oh, fun we're an account at JP Morgan Chase, because the chairman of our board used to be the CFO of the investment bank of JP Morgan Chase. Um, and when you look at that, you're just going, my God. Then it was like, Trump in the White House somehow directed, I don't know, the Small Business Administration to give Funware a loan. It's all nonsense. We didn't take a loan to get forgiveness. We took a loan because there was a program. Our business was hurt like every other business. It provided a means for us to be able to try to say, hey, how can we actually get through this with as less disruption as possible? And if anyone on the planet would have said, where can you get um, a, a loan um, th that has that low of an interest rate, trust me, I'd go to the Federal Reserve window. I'd go anywhere in the world if you can get a reasonable cost of capital for debt. 
um, whether they choose to forgive loans or forgive nothing, that, that's a U.S. government decision. But when people just make this claim of like, oh, because you have a customer that represents the campaign, therefore you were given treatment is nonsense. It's complete lies. It has nothing to do with reality. And we know that we would get uh, an award in terms of getting the PPP. And our word was that we got the money and now we have to pay it back. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But what else so, in the AP article was interesting to you that you want to know about? I'm happy to address every little bit of it. That, that's pretty much it. Uh, the data collecting, uh, look, uh, you know, look, I don't like data collecting on anything. So I know your app, your apps are not the only ones that do it. Uh, but, you know, I'm talking to you and this is your app. Sure. So the article does mention that about the data collecting um, and then how that blows up right because that is a fear as a normal person who's not involved not a ceo of a company just i uh, work hard at you know whatever trucker a, a waiting table whatever my job i'm using my phone and there's companies taking my information selling it using it you know and look we're all sick of that kind of stuff so i, I mean i'm right that and that's a simplistic way to put it but that's how the listeners are going to understand that the best right they understand what i'm talking about you're on facebook you're on this app you're on that app so the article does mention that about the Trump campaign app as well. That's taking this information, using it maybe in a deceptive way. I don't know. Do you want to speak to that? What, what do the apps oh, do with, so again, with that, that data, that, that information? Yeah. So, so some of the things you were asking me about don't do relative to the media. Okay. I'll ask you not to do it. generalizing. Uh, we're sick of it. That that's, that's you're sick of it. Um, the world is not. Uh, what Europe does with GDPR, we were in compliance in five minutes again, because remember, when I said we set up a funnel ID since we started the company, that was based on you or you, you have a sovereign self-identity. If you ever want to go read it, no one ever wants to do it for the media, uh, www.funware.com slash privacy. We have everything up and we've always had it up for years on every little bit of what goes on in any of the data, all the empowerment that a user of any application can use can decide that they want nothing tracked. They can decide they want nothing in their profile, or they can decide, hey, I'm going to consent to this terms of service for free Wi-Fi at Starbucks, and in return for that consent of getting free Wi-Fi, I decided that I'm going to give them my email address. I go to the grocery store. Oh, I can either just buy my groceries and leave, or I can say, here's my cell phone number tied to my loyalty card, and now I'm going to get a reduction of the cost of my groceries. Or you and I, we jump on a flight. We have rapid rewards. I don't have to use rapid rewards, but when I do and I travel enough, I can get a companion pass. I can get free trips and I choose to give them more information. So it's weird when this stuff gets couched about all this, it's deceptive. I can assure you, download the Trump app. First thing it's going to do is we'll probably ask you for your phone number. You have no obligation to do that. And also that's not a funware decision. That's the campaign decision. All the data that comes in Biden for Trump, those are their campaign's data. If you and I have any data, you can actually go directly to companies and you can go buy all the voter records. They're public records. There are people that go around and do is specialize in creating voter records. And so when you look at all these things, like if I ran Facebook, I would solve the problem in five minutes. Say, hey, great, you have two choices can have exactly what we have completely free across Facebook, Instagram, and you are the product. The data you provide, we're going to use it and we're going to figure out a target and we're going to advertise. And that's all. Or you can pay me $4.99 per month as a subscription and you can opt out. You won't do any tracking, but you're going to pay a subscription model for the right to do that. Not just to WWE Network or Disney Plus to say, hey, I'll give you 30 days of free trial. Consume as much as you want. I won't even charge you. But if you want to continue that subscription or you get that premium content, you get a paywall. And that's what happens with Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and, and everything in between. There's nothing unique about Funware. The ones that have all the data start with Apple and Google through Google, sure. Android, Apple iOS. Then you go to each brand we have uh, we trust me. We deal with very, very 
um, specific information that is very sacred, like doing healthcare across the country, patient health information and HIPAA. The only thing that's as challenging as dealing with that is children. CCPR, you know, the Child Protective Act. Um, sure. Under 18 years old, there's a whole series of things. But for us, you know, we've created a mobile loyalty ecosystem around what we call FunCoin and FunToken. FunCoin is like a is like tokenizing a data exchange for a value, so you can get an equity interest in the exchange. It's a registered security. Crypto is a bit weird in the United States, and a fund token is a medium of exchange. And we've created that so that you can get rewarded for whatever personal information that you want to share. If you opt into an audience, like, hey, I love professional football. Someone's trying to reach people that love professional football. You use that audience for marketing automation. You keep a blockchain record. So there's an immutable record. The brand knows what happened. You know what happened. And then you get compensated. And you actually can control your data. And we are the only ones I've met of all these groups that even about or even attempt to do this. Everyone else, that's just the business model. When I watch like deceptive this or deceptive that, Funware doesn't do anything deceptive at all. Funware actually allows you in every application to decide who you want to be and how much you value that brand. Because I assure you that brand is in reverse trying to determine how to engage you based on your perceived value to them. You know, if you were doing private jet membership, and I just got out of college and I'm making $20,000 a year, I'm probably not very valuable to a private jet membership. <laughs> sure. And but you have to admit, I mean, you have to admit there's a conversation. When I said we're sick of it, it's like, look, I don't hang out. No, no offense, man, but I don't hang out yes. with CEOs. Okay. So my buddies and my, my group, yeah, we don't like that people take our data and use it. And that's a major conversation across the world. So I, I don't think just saying it's just me. Now I, I get what you're trying to say, but you have to admit that that is a conversation that people have about their data and their concern with their data, right? Look, I lived so in Europe, for instance. There's for different laws over there in Europe that there are here in the United States. So I got to experience both situations, if you if you know what I'm saying. So there, yeah, there so are you and I were Chinese and we lived in mainland China. The idea that you would have privacy on anything would be laughable, right? They don't care. And so, so what my experience has been is you can't have 100% privacy and 100% security ever. You have to figure out the spectrum of where- I would agree with that. that. Okay. The other thing that I've, uh, that I've learned over time is you can have 100% privacy or 100% health. So when you talk about our ability as Funware, we've added all sorts of use cases and feature sets for corporate uh, customers. So when they're doing smart campuses for back to work in a safe, auditable way, uh, full contact tracing, full auditability, like all of that is much easier to do with a corporation who tell its employees, here's the survey you need to fill out about your health before you get here. Here's what you need to do when you arrive to access the facilities. Here's what you need to do if you've had interactions. Sorry about that. So oh, please, no worries. Um, so what I'm trying to do is go through and we provide every bit, you know, we do this for colleges and universities. Now you could say, look, I don't want you tracing every single place I go. I don't want you to know all of my personal business. And I completely get that. Yeah, but of course. You can't get all that privacy and then simultaneously the ability to control COVID with full contact tracing. It's real easy and it's successful in places like Singapore and, and other countries. Why? Because if your butt is not in your seat in your house, they will send the police or the military to show up and grab you and put you back in the place that you're supposed to have, much like if you had an ankle bracelet on, because that's effectively what they're doing. So there's this big battle between what's reasonably private and then what is reasonably either secure um, health. And we see that spectrum. So Funware, we find a way to never have a problem in this domain because we say to you and your friends, be whatever you want, do whatever you want, choose whatever you want, because that's your right. Sure. And we think that is the only, like, if you want to be tracked, then get 
off Facebook and Instagram. If you don't want to be tracked, I assure you, try to take Google out of your life. And I challenge you that you won't even be able to use the internet. You won't yeah. even be able to access maps. Sure. To the people. I think that's the problem. You're, you're basically saying my, saying the issue we all have, right? And that's that's difficult. It's not that we're being tracked. It's that I don't know what you're doing with that information. So look, I, I ran a, a restaurant, right? Food trucks. So if people, let, let's say I had a customer that always came in and ate. And then this guy came in one day and he said, hey, can you tell me about Sally over there that eats? Yeah. Listen, every Tuesday, she eats a tuna salad sandwich. She likes to sit at this table. She likes to wear this. When she comes in, she feels this way. And on this day and this, and I gave all this information about this person to this other third party that came in and then they left. And then Sally found out. She would go, whoa, why did you give that information? You didn't, I didn't know you were that when I came in here, you were collecting that about me to then sell to that guy. That's sure. a simple way to put it, but that's how people feel. Now, I don't think people have a problem with it because agreed. Look, we're moving forward. It's technology. I agree. This uh, 100% privacy is just nonsense. Silly to even say that. So I, I'm with you and I, I love companies and I love using them and I have nothing against it, but it's more just transparency. Like if you're going to sell my, just tell me who you're selling it to so that I know where my stuff's going. Or maybe that's the solution. I, oh, I don't know. Well, but let's think through this because what I, what I find remarkable in these conversations is that, um, okay, there's, there's three chunks of data and it's fascinating how people want to choose what to be passionate about. So one chunk of data is health data. You know, this is, do I have HIV status, COVID status? Um, do I have cancer in my family? Um, do I have a genetic problem? You know, whether it's going to be helpful or hurtful or, or used to help me or used against me, like all of that is, is sacrosanct, right? And, and it's so sacrosanct that none of your information makes any coherent sense to all the doctors and nurses because you're filling it out manually each time you do it. You can't even remember when you got vaccinations. You don't know when the hell you had the surgery when you were a kid. You don't know what drugs you were given. And all that information would be better if we would uh, approach it like I would approach the elections. I can solve the United States election problem. No one will let us, but I assure you I can solve it. It's blockchain to have an immutable record of everyone's vote. It is KYC or know your customer identity verification. So you know you're you and I'm me. And that vote is tied to that person. And we use bio and encryption to make it secure and to help authenticate that use case. And I assure you, whether you were doing any form of voting under the sun, you That's use interesting. biometrics and encryption every day. That's interesting. I mean, I, I do say that all the time. We bank online. We do all these things that are, and then my vote. So you are you saying like electronically we could do it maybe like from your phone or something or? Yeah, I could do, I could do all this. I can even do geofence policy enforcement to know if you're at your house, which also is a wee, way to check fraud based on location. It's the same thing you see. I when see what you're saying. Yeah. And brokers, right? So there's That's interesting. information is, is a data set. The next set of data is our digital footprint and all these things you and I are, are talking about and that get yeah. as if one group is doing something horrifically wrong. By the way, as it, you know, an aside in politics, the person who created all the way to do this was President Obama and he did it amazingly well and he was looked at as wildly progressive, amazingly that is true. because that he is was doing true. it. The only difference was that the same group that helped Obama was going to help Hillary Clinton except they no longer wanted to work for free because they had to make a living and feed their family and they refused for free. Hillary wouldn't pay them. So then what did they do? They jumped, and went to first, they started with like Cruz and others in the, in the GOP and on some surprising, you know, uh, but then they shifted to Trump and the only problem was orange man, bad Trump derangement syndrome. So because Trump was using it. Now it was this horrible thing, even though who really used it first was President Obama and Hillary Clinton had the right to use all of it, but they didn't want to pay for it. Group didn't want to work for free. They moved to the other side. Then they in, and now it's, oh, my God, the great hack. Oh, my God, every other. Net <laughs> you, right? you, uh, look, look, this is just a quick thing. I'm just noticing I, 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 get, I get this feeling that you don't like the left, but you're cool with the right. Just no, by the way, just by uh, just by the whole conversation we've had, because you always attack. Oh, left, which no, is not a problem. 
but I've no, noticed I'm that. A, I'm an experienced optimist, right? So I'm, I'm old enough now where the ideology when I'm younger of seeing what I think the world is like in my 20s uh, and then going off and serving our country and then living through the tech bubble, the real estate bubble out in Silicon Valley first, Southern California second. You know, I'm, I'm a 51 year old with seven kids. I've got a lot of experience now. I don't, uh, I was, I grew up in a democratic family. My, my father was a Mason, a manual Mason. I did block work and brick work and really hard labor. My mom worked as an assistant at junior high library. Neither one of my parents went to college. So I grew up in a democratic family where the democratic party represented blue collar workers. And then as time has gone through, I, I register as one party or the other because I can't vote on anything unless it's one party or the other. That's the bigger sure. two party well, system. I, I agree. I definitely agree with you there. A hundred percent. And so when we're talking about this data, the last part of the data we didn't get to, which is the most fascinating, which I would you know, challenge you and, and your listeners to think about. Sure. Medical data, digital footprint, and then all the things that we never say a word about. Your financial data. When exactly did you provide consent to Experian, TransUnion, or Equifax to analyze every transaction you've done in your life, every payment you've ever made, every point of sale purchase you've done so that you can get a credit score, you can get assessed on value and risk, and that yeah. everything in your life and the interest rates you get, and how you lease a car or not, how you buy a house, rent, every single thing you do up including your student loan activity, it's suddenly owned and controlled and sold off by a third party you've never consented to do it. Absolutely. Anything. Absolutely. So, so why does nobody talk about... We do. I don't know. Man, I, I don't know where what conversations you're at, but these things are absolutely... These conversations are absolutely happening. I don't know. I guess you don't hear that that part of it. No, or, I'm just or saying you that only hear no one, one will do it. anything about it, though. They, I mean, I, that's, that's, of course, I agree with you. Uh, yes. That, that's the issue, right? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, there was legislation that was just thrown into Congress to try to suggest um, that stable coins in the world of cryptocurrency should be 100% controlled by, you know, sovereigns in the existing financial system. Uh, it's a joke, right? It's, it's, it, and, the, and the guys is that we shouldn't allow crypto companies to do it. Because all the crypto and blockchain companies will abuse uh, the poorest of society and take advantage on racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. And you're like, that sounds uh, kind of like a traditional all- bank of what they've been doing <laughs> yeah. all existing, right? I so agree. It's, it's funny as hell to me to watch. And today, you know, hey, great news of the day, right? First national initiative that we're going to legalize marijuana, right? We're going to get rid of the criminality associated with marijuana. But did you really look at what it did? What it really did is it didn't address what it said as the punchline. The legislation is a mess. And what it really addressed is to preserve the dominance of alcohol and tobacco companies, not to actually decriminalize marijuana. So oh, we, interesting. I've got to read this closer. Yeah. So, so go read what it really is, but go watch how it's positioned. It's positioned as let's let people out of jail for having plants. Great. Yeah. I, yeah. I would love, I'm an, I'm an investor in uh, cannabis. One of the three founders of Funware, actually, when he left, we uh, you know, got a new CFO. He actually started a business from scratch in Colorado to medicinal to recreational you know, licenses. Nice. That work here, uh, we invested in him. He's awesome. And I've lived through watching it. I, I don't smoke. I, I, I sure. don't any of the, the drugs or any of that, but I'm not stupid about investment. And when I look at it, it is fascinating you know, if you run a cannabis company, you can't access banks. That's yeah, that's so taxed. weird. Yeah, you get taxed like crazy. Yeah, there's stories of people driving around vans with cash, nowhere to go. Like when you hear that, you're like, what? the? Heck? That sounds more dangerous than let's, right? Like, right. that's just asking for trouble. And and it and it is, and, and you're 100% right. So that's the thing where I always say that, you know, what you, in the headline is important to dig into. And so sure. you know, find uh, critical I, I thinking, consume, right? Cr- critical thinking. Yeah. I, I consume lots of content on CNBC today. 
you had the classic yeah. thing, Sorkin versus Santelli yet again, right? Except this time it's about lockdowns and the rules for thee and not for me. And I'm here in Austin and Mayor Adler, you know, what a clown. Uh, let me lead from the front by doing everything the exact opposite of what I'm trying to tell everyone else to do. Uh, within a week after uh -huh. it happened in multiple parties in California Sorry. and you know Chicago and everywhere else. So for me, it's level of, of insanity. And there shouldn't be anything controversial about science, but, but it's turned into that. Um, I am sure. much more concerned about people having the ability to make a living. And if people want to be told to be put on the sidelines, then use federal government, use quantitative infinity, print as much cash as you want, get a two month, three month, six month, whatever it is. But I'll tell you what, our whole country would be wildly better off with COVID, the country on a four to six week diet, including fitness, than if we actually did any of those things, because the elephant in the room of COVID is that we have a fat population on average and they're out of shape. And as a result, they're the ones most at risk and why not address it? Because all the comorbidities, you see wildly different outcomes based on just being in shape. And sure. well, I think health is, health is important for sure. Sure. And we, we try to incent our, our employees. We want everybody to be in great shape. Um, I, I, you know, I, I want to be as young as possible for as long as possible, but I just don't understand. We've gotten to a point where nobody can address elephants in the room and we're going to shape a narrative around something that's ridiculous. I, I, I hope nobody's overweight at your company that's going to hear no, this. They, that's their, they, they have every right to make whatever individual decisions. But what I said is what's missing in society is personal accountability and personal responsibility. And sure. there's to go through life. Uh, I, I that. owed something because God damn it, I'm here. Or uh, I'm going to get off my butt. Like my parents told me, you're in the greatest country in the world, which we are, and you can do anything you want, but you better get off your butt and you better work for it. And I know a lot of people that are way, way smarter than I'll ever be. Uh, I have very few people I meet that would actually be willing to outwork me because they probably care about food and drink and sleep way more than I do because I just don't care. I can sit here and a cup of coffee in the morning and Monday through Friday at work. I work nonstop and I don't break for breakfast or lunch and I'll enjoy dinner and whatever. But that works for me. But the reality is that a lot of people want results uh, for activity they never put in. Sure. And it doesn't work that way. Sure. Uh, I, t I totally uh, agree with that. A hundred percent. That's not, that's not, <laughs> not the way to live uh, any life. I think any reasonable person uh, would agree with that. Um, so something you said about the media that was interesting. I was thinking, um, you know, because I watch the media a lot just for work. I'm constantly watching different stuff for the podcast, right? Just to stay up to current events in case some, in case a guest brings something up, I want to be able to at least say something. So, sure. and plus I've always liked to watch both sides of things. So I'll watch pretty much anything under the sun to, to just hear what's going on. I noticed something, you know, it's, it really just, yeah, everybody thinks they're right. Okay. And it really just comes down to, you know, how you were raised, what your, your life, your empirical life, you know, what, what has happened to you to, to sure. lead you to these things. And then, you know, because you'll watch, it's interesting on YouTube. You'll, you'll see somebody will put up a clip of something that happened on the news. The right will take it and go, this person demolished this person. The left will take and go, this person demolished the other person, right? So it's all just perspective and how you look at it. And, that, and that's, that's why earlier I had a tough time saying, well, all the media is this. I just can't do that because I watch it all and I see the hypocrisy on both sides, to be frank with sure. you. So it's tough for me to say that. And I know journalists personally, and I know they don't have a bad heart and I know they work hard and do the thing. So I know there are journalists that do good things. Right. So well, assuming I want to have faith. I want to have faith in things. Right. As yeah. I move forward with things, Let me give you a good example. but I think critical thinking is probably the number one thing I would tell people to learn about to, t yeah. you know, to take the, How do you take that information? Cause you can't control what a private company is going to go. If you don't like CNN, then don't watch CNN, right? If that's your problem with it, then don't watch it. So if you're, the issue is the information, well, then that's just critical thinking. 
Right? That person needs to learn how to, you know, right? Like take in that that information and what to do with it. So that, that's all yeah, I wanted to say about we, it. Yeah, we but we have a societal deficiency in that ability, uh, sadly. So I would agree with that. Is that um, people uh, really want a soundbite? People don't want to put in the work or the thought. Uh, people would rather have a six second um, snap, a tweet, um, something to really dumb it down so that you don't have to put any effort into it or they don't sure. care, honestly. So there's a lot of people that it's like data, right? There's some people that they, they could care less. And of course, there's bad right? apples in everything. Right. But even on the journalists, like you can have the greatest, most well-intentioned journalists in the world. Um, and it is a great example. Um, Jeffrey Epstein, right? And Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair, like I, so I have very close contact with uh, someone who went to school and has a, you know, a roommate uh, from, a girlfriend from back in the day, uh, right? And wrote the original Jeffrey Epstein article for Vanity Fair, which was ruthless, calling out the charges with the FBI, the abuse of children, and all and on and on, right? And that story was completely shifted by the editor and the powers that be to turn it into a Jeffrey Epstein love fest of how amazingly wonderful he was not calling out any of it. And then sure. that saga- I think continued. that was in the documentary that I saw on Netflix. Yeah, so, so you saw the documentary. I know yeah. the people involved that actually did it. And then you watch it get overridden and that person who wrote the original article was devastated because she was writing what the truth was. Sure. He's repositioned 180. And so sure. in cases, like when I watched the New Yorker and someone with a Rhodes Scholar, and you think, wow, a Rhodes Scholar, and you're willing to fact check nothing. You're even being told what the facts are but it's not going to let the truth get in the way of a good article. And sadly that's becoming too prevalent. And that, it, so who are your, who are your journalists that you read, you read their article and you trust everything they say, who, who do you read? Uh, well, I read lots and I don't trust. So I used to trust, but verify. Now I distrust all, but verify. I don't assume anyone's right. I assume, that there's a narrative or agenda until someone can prove that they're just stating truth and facts and they're not trying to make the conclusions. Uh, yeah. And also now, I mean, like, hell, I'm sitting here on with you. I could go to like, let's see, the 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 number of like Yahoo, right? Yeah. So let's pull it up and uh, you see headlines, right? Researcher says Google fired her in dehumanizing way. Oh, not a whole bunch. Something about the Steelers. Uh, you immediately get something thrown up uh, talking about, you know, uh, Giuliani's die disaster hatchet, right? Then you see something that we, we, you struggle depending on who's the one putting out the headlines. Um, all the headlines, very easy now just to go to them and say, okay, if I read Yahoo or if I read Inc or Forbes, especially now, go look at Forbes. And Forbes and Inc used to be, hey, this is business stuff. Forbes, there's nothing to do with business anymore. It is all politics, all agenda, and it's all narrative. And I'm like, what world did this happen to to read, to learn about, you know, it's like Wired or something, like the old new, new markets, new. Th so now I, I do read the same things from TechCrunch to, you know, anything in between. I just accepted that there's a what is the real narrative? In the same way that you watch, you know, a Tesla trading day and half of the world wants Tesla to go to zero and half the world wants Tesla to go to 5,000. And there is a battle of information. And what's funny is no one regulates the financial boards. People put anonymous things and one group might be pumping, another group might be shorting and everything is a game in the open casino of Wall Street, right? And if I can put out a bad story, I can drive the stock price down. You know, sure. the, the great irony of that Twitter hack were smart to, instead of doing what they did, but they were kids, right? They were brilliant to be able to figure out what they hacked. Um, I at least could have a certain mode of respect for that. But they had bought a massive pile of put options in Tesla 
and then put out a tweet. We regret to inform you that Elon Musk is dead during the trading day. Or you go to Pfizer with call options and you say COVID vaccine approved from the official Pfizer site. Do you know how much money people could have made by actually doing that? All they had to do is take a position in the equity markets. We've heard rumors that back in 9-11, before 9-11, there were massive positions taken out that the U.S. stock market was going to plummet. And the terrorists bought the equivalent of options on the United States stock market and funded terrorism by actually ringing the register <laughs> off not crazy. because yeah. they knew it was happening. So yeah. that's why I said that I'm not anyone other than I, I care about truth. Uh, I care about honor, ethics, integrity. Um, when people are not in charged environments, I've met great people all over the country and around the world. And what people care about is what I learned in the military. No one cares about race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, religion, or political party in a fox. You know what you care about? The person to your left, the person to your right, that we're all going to protect and work with each other and know who the enemy is. And we're all going to make it back to our family and be able to have drinks and food together. And that's really the simplistic. Huh? Every day of my life, I say, look, I'm going to eat. I'm going to sleep. Uh, I'll see my family because I'm not traveling right now. And nobody's shooting at me. Like, how bad could this possibly be? Um, so these things like AP or New Yorker or these other ones, it has required to sort of take a breath, not get emotional about things, just sort of accept that there are people that are very comfortable uh, making money in certain ways and people that are very comfortable not worrying about who might be hurt. Um, the ones that have the most to gain are the media companies. If you can create clickbait, you can create eyeballs. It used to be, you know, let's go to war. We can watch live war on CNN or some other network. Yeah, that's true. And, well, look at Newsmax, now, right? Newsmax just blew up uh, in three weeks. Yeah, but you know nothing why? from but zero. You know why though, right? For, for me, I mean, you're not going to like my answer, but completely touting complete nonsense, in my opinion. I've watched Newsmax so much. I'm just like, I can't even believe that's a news channel. No, I mean, if you like news checks, uh, Newsmax, I'm sorry. It goes, what, it goes back to what I said. There's, there's two parties. There's two factions in each one. GOP establishment and Trump on the right. And on the left is sort of, I call it the moderate and the progressive left. Yeah. But when you then siphon off the news... What you see, the result of, of AN and, and Newsmax coming out is because they realize there's a market beyond Fox to go after the Trump party, which is yeah. from exactly. the establishment GOP, which is Fox. Sure. And, then and, Fo else and Fox got, got demolished uh, in three weeks as well. It's like, well, that, I that's never, what happens. I, never thought I would see that. <laughs> yeah. So, when, when, but that's, that's what happens when a group confuses who its audience is. And doesn't understand that there's 75 million people or whatever the, the numbers turn out to be. Yeah. We're not for the GOP established base, which is why you see this craziness going on in, in Georgia, the Senate, because people are saying, look, if, if you were assuming Trump was going away, uh, no, that's not the case. And if you think the traditional establishment GOP is going to get the reins handed back, uh, no, it's not. And the group is saying, we will not allow this. So you're going to see that play out no different than watching the Green New Deal and the Bernie Sanders and the squad part of the Democratic Party versus the others. And I'm not telling you anything you don't see, because we all see it with our own eyes and ears. But, you know, the institutions we have should be sanctimonious. They should be trustworthy. They should matter. And when you start seeing where that's broken down dramatically, um, you know, it's in the military, you know, there is no greater power in the world than the military industrial complex. Uh, war is good. It's good to be in the Pentagon and then be a general and then go off and get a great board seat and get all sorts of great jobs. Uh, but when war ratchets down, great ironies about the, you know, the, the terror of Trump. He's actually uh, the only president since back, I think, to Reagan 
uh, may even be further back, that actually hasn't put us in a net war. We actually have peace in the Middle East. And uh, but there's word that just came out he might attack Iran right now. <laughs> like literally, I don't know if you read that. Maybe well, it is. so so you know, it's I mean that's the great irony, right? So back when you look at these, you have that would uh, be crazy if he did it, and all these people, you know, that have been saying, you know, we we're not that Trump hasn't done that, and then in the last month he does that. I, I would be mad if I was a Trump supporter. I'd be like, damn, Trump, I've been <laughs> I've had your back all these years saying you didn't well, do that. Didn't do but that. see what's happened, right? When when you've when, when they did eliminate the Palestinians and the Iranians from the conversation, what are you seeing in, in God honest truth? You're seeing first ever flights over Saudi Arabia between the UAE and Israel. You're seeing Bahrain, the UAE, the Saudis, their recognition by the Arab League of Israel instead of um, Jews are bad, Israel needs to die, everything needs to be destroyed. Well, that's a healthy set of developments, just like I remember watching the Winter Olympic Games in Yugoslavia. Now it's Bosnia and Serbia. And the, the recent successes there, that is fantastic for humanity. It's wonderful. Um, so when you see some of these things, uh, what's not wonderful is if you're in the military industrial complex uh, and there's a lot of money that's suddenly not available because the, the latest and greatest war, uh, the, the Iranian-Palestinian thing has been a... A, a a problem for decades upon decades. And even John oh. Kerry, you know, was so confident in what he believed. He was just saying there is no peace in the Middle East without the Palestinians and, until, you know, we moved the embassy. Uh, now you do have more peace. I, this is a good thing. I, I, I'm a big fan. No one, like I said, no one appreciates peace more than a soldier. Because it, of course, it is brutal Absolutely. to be the instrument of public policy. Um, but I, you know, in the military, I care about politics, uh, I still don't really care about politics other than I believe it's important because the three branches of government haven't functioned in the way we were accustomed to. The courts on the judicial branch seems to have suddenly taken over a legislative agenda because the legislation doesn't work. That's not supposed to happen, but it, but it did. And you've seen a lot more tech executives and other executives from companies all across the country and around the world uh, who now have to engage our employee base, our customers, our partners, and the world at large. And we do have to be able to share opinions, of what we're doing and why. And it's yeah. not a way to say, uh, who's the locus? Who's the biggest cancel culture? Do what I say or else. Cater to an angry mob. Use science to say that if you protest, it's all good. But if you're going to church, it's all bad. I mean, you can't tell being stupid things, expect a good outcome. You can't say the liquor store is essential, but oh my God, don't you dare go to church. Or the restaurant can't be open, just the liquor store. <laughs> like there's so many things that everyone knows sound as ridiculous as they are. Social distance. Oh, but don't go on a surf board in California, we're going to arrest you for being by yourself on a paddleboard. What? Really? Um, I think my biggest issue has been the relief not being passed uh, for people. It's been months. I, I honestly, d disappointing from all facets of government. Uh, sure. You know. Well, that's what happens when the legislative branch can't function. The Fed does what okay. the Fed does. You know, QE yeah. and FE overlaid with 0% interest rates. Uh, great. Uh, but the rest of it um, is fascinating to watch. And it's sad because it's all, uh, you know, I think um, it, both sides are completely guilty. Um, when you're in this situation, go big or go home makes a lot of sense. The idea is that we're not going to have, you know, federal tax reimbursements to feed back to either the companies or to direct check for individuals. All that to me is kind of nonsense. And, but, it, you know, I look at the news today and there were some things that came out including um, the house speaker. She said, yes, I've been holding up this for six months and admitted it. And she said it, um, that doesn't mean the other side hasn't been any less guilty, but when you, when you wrap everything around a presidential election and the situation we're in, um, the easiest way to solve it is to suspend all political salaries until you have a resolution. It's amazing. I, I would have agreed with that a hundred percent. I would have been sure. down with that. Absolutely. Yes. And healthcare. 
during COVID. I'm going to take away your health care during COVID until you figure this out. Because yeah, look, so there, my, there, my, there my are solutions. Things. Yeah, yeah. Go, I'm sorry, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I was just going to say there, there are solutions to all these. Um, you know, I, I had the most extreme ever that I, I say in jest, but, you know, you ever <laughs> solve bipartisan politics. Uh, this will never happen. But uh, you take uh, Speaker of the House, um, you take the Senate Majority Leader, you give them 24 hours, you put them in a room and you say, you know what, nothing's working. We're going to just let the two of you in the next 24 hours decide, pick a topic like Medicaid, Medicare, first topic, throw them in the room, let them just go at each other all day, all night, 24 hours pass. You know, they'll never resolve anything because they can't. Uh, and so then what you do is you go on national public broadcasting and you shoot both of them in the head, right? Uh, then you grab the next person in the house, the next person in the Senate, you say 24 hours, you two up, go in the room and you'll see more bipartisanship in the history of humanity. Um, and now there are people that would be tragically, sadly, no longer with us, which I, I'm not advocating for at all, but I'm saying hypothetically, you and I both know that the next two up would solve Medicaid and Medicare in 24 hours because all the bullshit would be done. And now it would just be, hey, you and I pick a topic. We're going to figure it out. We don't care how challenging it is. There is a middle ground for everything and we can find a way to solve it. But the way it's never going to get solved, two-party politics, uh, unlimited dark money, no term limits, no age limits. You know, you should have minimum and maximum age. You should have term limits. Uh, there are so many easy ways to solve this problem. There's no desire to do so. I mean, I could have done care.gov at Funware for way less money and it would have worked. I could have made an all mobile healthcare and bypassed the entire website and delivered an entire ecosystem for the U.S. government, um, but you're not allowed to. State of Florida could have done the same thing for employment systems that crashed because even today, 75% of enterprise infrastructure has not yet gone to the cloud. You would think that's impossible. You know, you look yeah. at Azure and Google Cloud and AWS. Nope, not at any level. And so there are systems, much like I said earlier, you can solve it with blockchain. You can solve it with biometrics, encryption, and you wrap it around KYC identity management. Why it is somehow... Like, oh my gosh, in order to fly, you need to prove your identity. But to vote, don't worry about it. Makes no sense. It's not hard to solve these problems except for the lack of the willingness to solve them. And now we have the situation we do. And anyone, you know, saying there's no fraud is crazy. The ones that say that's hey, me. That, that's me saying that. Like, there's no fraud that's going to change the election, and there's no more fraud than there is every election. That's yeah, what I'm saying. so I, I feel like I have pretty good data and information, and so I would respectfully disagree um, that, first of all— Is your data and information just from the hearings, the same hearings I'm seeing, and reading the same <laughs> affidavits and the same court cases? Because I have access uh, to all the same public information, so— no, Unless I have, you're I have access something to, different than I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I have access to more information than just, you know, what you see in these public things. And so look, and, and I also think you have access to evidence from these lawyers or what o outside of public I, evidence. I, saying, I have no, com no comment on why I know what I know. But what I'm saying is that um, there are certain things a, having two degrees in engineering, including the best school on the planet from Georgia Tech for industrial systems engineering. That's the best in the world for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, certain things are mathematical impossibilities. But there's people that have the, have have just the equal degrees as you saying the complete opposite. So I, I don't know. I mean, you preface well, that with the degrees, uh, hopefully that that would give it legitimacy to what you were going to say. And I respect that. But there are people with equal degrees or even better that are not saying that. So what do you say to that? Uh, what do I say is that it's funny to me that I bet you we could take a bunch of experts in the United States and we could have a split down the middle as to whether we're on Earth or Mars. Whether it's daytime well, or nighttime. Well, that, that's not making your point, though. That's sort of making No, my point, point is like, I'm, you know, <laughs> uh, hopefully you can understand that um, operating um, real time data. Let me use an example that's a different example but will 
we'll, we'll address the point because I'm, I'm not going to go into any details of all the nonsense that's pending. Puerto Rico, pre and post hurricane, where Puerto Rico was devastated. And then the territory of Puerto Rico needed to get a certain budget from the U.S. government. And the U.S. government wanted to provide a certain budget for relief. And what's the one thing that can't lie of anything between the more people that are in Puerto Rico, the higher the budget is, um, the less people in Puerto Rico, the lower the budget is. There's the federal government's data, including where all the citizens and visitors are at and what all of their immigration papers show. And then there's what you see from the territory of Puerto Rico and its systems and what it shows. So ironically, the great equalizer of truth uh, is this, a phone. So you know what happened? We went through a, a month before, a month after, three, six, and 12 months after the hurricane destroyed big chunks of Puerto Rico. And you know what we found is we could be the arbiter of truth. Why were we so uniquely in a position to do that? Because what doesn't lie is where your phone is. And when you light up where everyone's phone is a month before, a month after, three, six, and 12 months, and you see little blue dots all over South Florida to South Texas and everywhere else, you can see because what nobody leaves home without is this. They'll travel, they'll try to do things without, you know, credit cards, they might not take an ID, uh, but, you know, it's kind of like when you're the IRS, how do they figure out where you really live? Uh, they figure out where your kids are enrolled in school. When they can't figure that out, they go to your pets and figure out where you leave your pets, because on average, your pet is going to be where your household is. <laughs> so you can start finding things um, where you can use mobile devices because the one thing that people don't have to worry about being chipped, they're already chipped. They're already GPS traceable. Absolutely. They're already traceable indoors and out, high and low density Wi Fi, physical and virtual beacons. I walk with this device, I pass a beacon, Bluetooth pings, you know where you're at with an X, Y, and a Z coordinate. You even can say, What floor am I at? What room am I in? Where am I sitting? Every bit of this data is a lot easier. And so the Puerto Rican example would be no different than taking a device ID from south of the border, figuring out which devices that device meets with, who do they meet with, and where they travel. And within a couple hours, you can reverse engineer a human trafficking ring in Mexico because this device went to that device. They have free applications on their phone. They have honing signals. And then you can see through proximity and location services where all these things are at. So we had fun with, you know, when, when people are trying to learn, we wouldn't know anything unless people want us to know it. Uh, we don't know what questions to ask of data. But when you have a petabyte of data, when you have five you know, gigs per day added, when you have 800 million to a billion devices, um, it's not hard to figure out what's really going on in the world of you, you might not know what the right question is to ask, um, but the same reason you see Palantir and all the things they do for governments around the world, um, you know, when you get over 15 billion devices, that's Facebook, that's Google, you know, we're a, we're a small public tech company, uh, but the, there's a great responsibility, I find me and our team, because when you see all these articles and things, I don't need these articles, even if they were telling the full truth, I already know what it is that we're doing, how we do it, um, how you have to protect children. You know, nobody cared about protecting any kids. We've been doing that for 12 years on mobile. No one even cared to have laws or rules to govern the protection of children. We learned that really early back to the first question you asked about discovery. That was Mythbusters. But the other group we worked with was Discovery Education. What is that? That's K through 12. Yeah. And in the discovery newsfeed, you have to make sure that if there's a discussion about abortion, you're not putting that in front of like a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 12-year-old. Totally. And so yeah. we had moderation platforms before anyone even thought of what to do to protect kids. Now, when legislation goes on through GDPR and all these other things, 
right? For us, that was easy because we always assumed you're in charge of you. Uh, when you go through and how the networks work at Twitter and Google and Facebook and Snap, uh, it's not set up that way. We are the product. That's the only thing that everyone should say. You are the product, period. As long as you understand it, opt in or opt out. Yeah, that's no pretty much there. it, right? That's pretty much yeah. it. You're right. That's it. All right. Well, I know we went way yeah. over. I think we went no, man, I, I, I was just going to say that. Uh, listen, I really appreciate um, your, your thing. Real quick, uh, I always talk a little, just two seconds. Just tell us. I have to talk a little bit about food. Just tell us your favorite place to eat in Austin. What's your favorite place to eat in Austin? Where do you like to go? Uh, Uchiko. Wow. Great. I used to work. Uh, I used to work for high hospitality. Great. Fantastic. Right. Uchiko. And then is, if I they, wouldn't they say that, I would say Jeffrey's. Yeah. Both. Fantastic. Okay. Man, you got good taste, man. You got good hey, taste. Number three, like number three would be Clark's. Yeah. All right. Yeah, man. Yeah. You got great taste. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, listen, yes, Alan, you, you've been absolutely phenomenal to talk to. I really appreciate the conversation. This is why I love my job so much. I get to have these amazing conversations with super smart people and learn something new and, you know, hopefully give our listeners something, an exciting conversation. They can sit back. I think they're going to learn a lot and be very interested in, in uh, what we had to say today. So I really appreciate the time uh, for sure. You taking that time. Yeah, no us. worries. And uh, sorry that I feel like I'm a a cold blanket on some of the things that go on. Oh, no, uh, this is a conversation. This is you being you and me being me. There's nothing. Sure. I don't judge, man. I'm a, I don't judge. I, you be, you know, that's, this is what, ha this is what it was. And I appreciate your candor and I appreciate your willingness to dig in. And, and, you know, that's, that's very endearing and uh, very genuine. So people are going to respect that to, to be honest with you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having me and have a great weekend. Thank you, brother. You too, my All man. Right. Uh, God bless and uh, you and your family be safe. Yeah, thank same you. to you, buddy. Bye. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Yeah.